Uh, speak with the lads. Here's a result of our Twitter poll. We were running this on the RTE uh, Soccer Twitter account during our television broadcast. The question was, what is your opinion of VAR? The results were as follows. 8% of you would keep it as it is. 54% would keep VAR but making changes. And 38% would scrap it all together. Now, if you're with us on the TV broadcast, uh, you will have seen Tottenham really hammer Red Star Belgrade, winning by five goals to nil. We're going to go back to uh, London now, and we're going to hear from one of uh, Tottenham's goal-scoring heroes. Son is chatting with Tony O'Donoghue. Congratulations on a, on a terrific performance. Two goals for you. How important was that for the confidence to be restored for Tottenham? Yeah, I think the win, win the game is, I think, almost... Uh, the most important thing and I think uh, the way how we played, how we perform, I think that was uh, so, so important and great and yeah, I think we are really happy to get three points here and then uh, back to winning ways and back to, uh, back to winning mentality and I think, I think that was an uh, 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 important thing. What have you done differently since the last couple of games that haven't gone so well? Any, anything? No, nothing, nothing. I think we we were just more more be more aggressive, and from the start we were there. We want to score early goal, and we want to prog progress uh, every single single um, single uh, attack and a uh, defense is all uh, with with the ball without ball. And I think that's why we work uh, really really hard to get a early goal. And after uh, Harry scored the early goal, then both uh, the players got a, a more. Uh, Confidence, and I think that was the most important to to be start uh, start well. Great assist from Lamella for your first, uh, from Ndombele for your second. So there's a new creativity in the side, it seems. Uh, no, I think we everyone understand really, really good. Of course, uh, we didn't play well. Uh, we we didn't got a uh, uh, not right a result uh, until until now, and yeah, it's already passed. I think we are focused on from now and. We, want to go winning ways and winning mentality, what I said before, and I think this is most important. The past is already gone. The, the future is coming, and we have to be ready every single game. Well done tonight. Thank you very much. Yeah, you had a super game. OK, thank you uh, to you at home for uh, your questions to the hashtag Ask the Panel. Uh, the first one we're going to deal with comes from Dylan Moore. And Dylan asks, who do Tottenham need to sign in order to return to their peak? Or is there parallels between Poch now and Klopp in his last season at Dortmund, having done all he can with this particular squad? Would a managerial change suit better? Liam, do you want that one first? How many a few questions. Yeah, there's a fair few questions in there. Yeah. We want a big answer. Well, uh, no, the manager's all right. I wouldn't okay. change the manager. No, the manager's good, I think. He's had a, a, a tough job with all the goings on behind the scenes, players out of contract. I know we covered that earlier on. If we were going to sign a player, if I was going to sign a player for sports, I'd like to get a dominant midfield player who can pass the ball, uh, you know, left to right, can switch play. Um, but... Everybody's looking for those guys, yeah. you know, the Modric kind of. They had them one time at Spurs. Someone who can run the game for them. I don't think they've got the players. Sissoko, I think he's just a big physical player. Uh, and Dembélé didn't do bad tonight, but it was easy for him. So someone in the mould of a Modric who can run the game. Um, but, they, you know, they have, they have uh, uh, a lot of good players there. Um, I think the club's probably going to... Uh, it's on the up. I, I think being led by uh, by Daniel Levy, Pochettino staying as manager, it's on the up. They've, they're having a hard time of it at the moment, but I think any club would struggle when you've got disgruntled players who are out of contract. Hopefully, in the six months after after the season finishes, they can get rid of those players and get other players in who want to play for the club. Mm. Richie, it's hard to know how much money they have to spend because we could rattle off a list of players or areas they need to strengthen in, but we've no idea how much money Levy's going to give to the manager, and we assume there's going to be no um, 11th hour contract agreement to keep Christian Eriksen, or to keep Vertonghen, or Alderweireld. Danny Rose, they probably don't want to keep him, even if he wanted it. Um, so I think to get them back to where they were, if they got a Christian Eriksen who's fully committed and focused and at his best, that would be a hell of a a, a yeah. signing to make between now and the end of the season. I can't see that happening, though. No. What's your take, Kevin? Um, sort out the current situation with the players, as the lads said. I think 
they're in that awkward position where they've reached a Champions League final. Who do you sign? You know, right now where they are, who wants to go there that's good enough to get them back to that level? You know, if you're good enough to be playing the Champions League final, you, you're not going to go to Tottenham Hotspur. You're going to go to Man City. Well, you've got to be good. Your scouting's got to be good. Yeah. They, it has been good in the yeah. past. You know, they signed Modric, they signed uh, Gareth Bale from Southampton, they've signed all these players, Ericsson from Ajax, Bert, uh, Bertongen from Ajax, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah. So the, the scouting has been strong. They need to be strong again. And their chance was so, that. Their yeah. chance was in the summer after the Champions League. They could have attracted, you know, a lot. Well, of Well, he needed there. to clear out first, sudden, didn't yeah. he? Yeah, that I was, think. Yeah, it's a business for yeah. Spurs. It's not like it's. We've said this before. It's not Man City where money doesn't matter. It's not Chelsea when Abramovich was throwing the money around. You know, it's difficult you know, to balance the books yeah. and get the players you want. It's not and an easy job. And in January, it'll be particularly difficult if we look to make signings that are going to be, you know, make a real impact in the long term ones. Generally, January signings are, are, are difficult to come by. But yeah. also, as well, it'd be interesting to, from a distance, say, well, if players are available in January and if they have money to spend, are they going to give it to Pochettino? Or are there some internal discussions going on that we don't know about, which is with a view to. to, to change a manager down the road because if they yeah. think internally for whatever reason for whatever reason not because of his ability or his talent or his personality or his approach to the job there does come a time mm. where just a relationship doesn't work and it's got to end for whatever reason so they might be at that time soon if they don't pick up results between now and Christmas they'll be at that time. Let's talk about a, another Tottenham player and, and this uh, comment and, and question comes in from Brendan Vahey. It's on Twitter and Brendan says, would the panel have included Troy Paris in tonight's Spurs squad instead of playing him in the under-19s earlier on today? Now, if he hadn't played for the under-19s, but he scored four goals in their UEFA Youth League win uh, over Red Star. He's, Kevin, a, a huge yeah, talent. What about the benefit of, of having Troy playing see, for the senior team tonight? It just all depends. We don't know how he's training with the first team or how yeah. things are going. So it's difficult to say, well, he should be involved. If he's, you know, he might be having a tough time with the senior team at the moment for whatever reason. So, you know, he has been involved in the past. He's not at the moment. Probably for that reason, he hasn't shown as much in training as he was. He's young. He's still developing. Been away at his international side a lot recently. So he's probably better playing at that age group, okay. getting four goals today, giving him confidence and getting him back into that first team sort of surroundings and training well again. He has a squad number for the Champions League. No, no, he's 17. Uh, to, to answer the question directly, I, I'd put him in Would just you? because I have... A, a, an, an interest in his career progressing. Yeah. But if I'm the manager at Tottenham, I need to remove either Christian Eriksen or Lucas from the bench. And if I'm managing a dressing room, which already has disgruntled players, well, the last thing that is going to help my relationship with those two is to bin them for a 17-year-old yeah. who, who hasn't done anything in first-team football yet. He did play once against Colchester in the League Cup, mm. which they lost in penos. I think he played about 68 minutes. Didn't have a good game. It was difficult conditions to do well. Um, but there's a big difference, there's a jump between doing well against other teenagers in a youth tournament to doing well at the level that the first team play at. Mm. So I, I, I'd yeah. be patient with the fellow. But, uh, indeed, and we will. And uh, uh, some people won't be, but that's fair enough because he, he is such a talent. But he's 17 years of age and uh, Pochettino, does, he does like him. He, he rates him, he's spoken... You know, very favourably about him in, in the you know in the early parts of the season and in the in the well, close season. And as yeah, well. Pochettino has a has a track record mm. of giving young players a chance. So uh, you'd have to say uh, that Richie's right. If he hasn't picked them, there must be a reason why. Uh, but certainly, I think if he had been there tonight and put him on for 20 minutes, if he's if all he's cracked up to be, he would have he would have got a couple of goals against this uh, <laughs> and this Red Star defence. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm waiting to see him. But probably the, the timeline for him means, Dara, that he's got to go out on loan and do it in the championship or something like sure, that. Sure, OK. Um, there's something I wanted to bring up, and, and, and you probably have been reading about this over the last 24 hours. A major new study uh, revealed that former footballers are approximately three and a half times more likely to uh, die from a neurodegenerative disease than the general population. And, and with all three of you lads, I wanted to, to get your views on this, because I know, Kevin, and you've spoken a lot about about um, issues around concussion, around head injuries, your own career, you, it was ended on medical advice. Now, what was your, what was your instant reaction when you read this study from, from Scotland? Um, yeah, I wasn't totally surprised. I didn't know the exact figures. This yeah. is the first time I've seen that figure mentioned, but, you know, I haven't been told about it and all the different stories with, 
with um, the NFL and different things, it's mm -hmm. not surprising, I think. Um, especially going back in the area this study was taking a sample of players from um, when, when the ball would have been in the air a lot more, when the ball would have been a lot heavier. Um, you know, it's definitely going to cause more issues, I'd imagine, for those players than the current crop of players coming through, hopefully, who are under a lot better guidance and, and medical guidance and a lot better protocols, as they mm. call it, to uh, hopefully avoid this in the future. Liam, did it shock you, those, those no, numbers? No, I'm not no? surprised at all. I, I know too many uh, uh, of uh, some teammates, some contemporaries who are suffering uh, with these illnesses, mm. uh, and it doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, when I when I think back of all the all the balls they would head, not in games only, Dara, but they used to like the centre backs and the centre forwards would practice for you know hours in a, in in the course of a week on heading the ball as hard as they could, and people would be crossing it, and centre backs would be heading it away, trying to head it away as far as they could. But it might be a wet winter's morning when the ball was soggy and the yeah. ball was heavy. I'm not surprised at all. I have a couple of my teammates you know who I played with at Arsenal who are suffering uh, and it doesn't surprise me at all and, and uh, there has to be more um, uh, study of this mm. and uh, some precautions may have to be taken especially for young kids especially for you know young young boys who are uh, whose you know physique is not being uh, yeah. uh, 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 is not being formed I listened to somebody on the radio today an expert saying like your brain doesn't form till you're 18 to 24, and if you're heading the ball at 11 and 12 and 13 years of age, yeah. it might be dangerous. It might change football completely. We'll just have to wait and see. Richie, Richie, what do you think? Do you think this has the potential to, to utterly change the game of football? Well, I suppose we're relatively early on in the process mm. um, for many, many years, and a lot of footballers and their families can can give their own accounts. It's difficult for a lot of the, the football world to take player welfare seriously. That's been kind of the case for, for a long, long time. So studies like this, I think there will probably be, be more of them, a little bit more comprehensive, and we'll keep getting results similar to that. So then the question then is, what, what do you do with that information? If you now know that re repetitively hitting the ball, we assume this we're talking about, is going to put players at long-term risk of their health, Again, I, I don't know how you react appropriately to, yeah. to that. Um, your instinct tells you you've got to do something. You can't just keep getting these reports saying, OK, yeah, we're all at greater risk, but let's change nothing. That would seem to be an odd response. So we'll wait and see what, what you do. But I assume mm. you've got to do something. Yeah. But the I, knowledge I, is there now that, cert yeah. that, that certain behaviours in this, to call it a job, puts your health at long-term risk. Um, you have to do something, as you yeah, say. But like it's, we, we it's are seeing alterations in in underage soccer, the Americans yeah. would call it, in the States, where kids are, are yeah. prevented. And when I first read that, I laughed at it. I was like, well, I can't believe they're stopping kids heading it. But as I've got more knowledge, and, and you, as Liam said, you heard on the radio today, but after hearing speaking to experts over the last couple of years, yeah. that is the time when the most damage can be done, is that age from 13 to 21, I think it is, when your brain yeah. is developing as quick as so. It makes sense. I, don't, I wouldn't like to ban it totally at that age, though, because you have to learn the technique, and if you, if you don't learn the technique at a young age, then you're going to do more damage trying to head the ball later on, because you're going to be heading it wrong in the wrong place. Place. So it's, it's, it's getting a, some sort of happy medium. It's not been silly. You know, if I knew what I knew now, I wouldn't be going out after training probably three days a week and practicing crossing and finishing and heading. I might go out and do one or two instead of going out and heading 50 balls yeah. or whatever. You, it, you, it's doing it. But that's what you're told, right to the same. Yeah. you're told to do that. that that's, and you would have been praised for doing it. You'd be praised for doing it. That's yeah. you being diligent mm. and a proper professional yeah. and a good attitude. Look at him last out on the training ground without actually realizing you could be doing the very thing that is going to cause a long-term difficulty. Mm. Well, actually, just reading some of the comments, that the chief executive of the, the FA in London, Mark Bullingham, said, now we have one piece of the puzzle, but unfortunately, it's just one piece. We can't see why there is a link between footballers and dementia. But I think, as, as the lads have said, we're going to see more and more of these studies, and unfortunately, uh, the results will be just the same or very similar. Just before we go, let's go back to London, and we'll hear from the Tottenham manager, Maurizio Pochettino. Since Harry Kane had his Champions League debut under you, only Lewandowski and Lionel Messi have scored more goals than him in the group stage and leading again by example. How important is it to have a player of his quality and his mentality in your team? How supportive has he been to you in this tough time? Yes, I think uh, 
the players were very supportive and, and of course um, the player that played today and the player that didn't play and I think we, we have a I think the squad we are a squad that uh, we we are all together fighting to try to to find or to achieve our, our always our objective and but of course um, the player around the pitch only can score and of course for Harry is playing a lot of game with us and always was important player but um, I'm happy and now um, being calm and and of course like always working hard and, and trying to improve this type of period happen in any team we need to be strong. Yeah, he had a good night and Tottenham had a good night. That is all we have time for. Thanks to Kevin, Liam and Richie for joining me here in studio. We will see you again soon. Bye-bye.